Good morning, and I'd like to thank you to uh, allow me the opportunity to talk with you and share with you some ideas related to new challenges in urban education. We don't have to work too hard to hear that there's new challenges in education, whether you read it in the newspaper or you hear it on TV. And many people are grappling with how can we transform education or transform what's in the classroom to influence and affect quick change to allow for our students to move forward in this ever-changing world. I'd like to present with you three unique challenges, new challenges, that we're all addressing here in education. The first one is safety. The question of how can we provide safe classrooms, safe schools, and make children feel safe in the community. Many of the initiatives you might be hearing of is bullying policy or having police presence in the schools or also having community watch. The second new challenge is that of technical skills. We have already are working with this rapid change in technology. So teachers are struggling with how to accommodate the changes in technology and they are told that they have to prepare students for the current workforce and implement real life examples into the classroom. However, the majority of the teachers have gone from their college classroom into their own classroom teaching. So where are they going to get these new real life experiences to then share with the students to prepare them? And then the third unique challenge is citizenship. How can we inform students to have social skills and social practices to work to be part of a team or to be part of a community? I want to share with you and bring you into the lives of two children. Okay. These children are 137 years apart, but I think by delving into the lives of the children, it might help us come up with some of the important attributes to help us solve these problems that might have historically been overlooked. The majority of education histori um, historical studies are usually at a macro scale where policymakers are looking at specific subgroups of populations. And there's a, a scarcity in education history talking about the real lives of children and what experiences they have. So I'm just asking both of you to look at the children and to act as detectives to immerse yourselves into their lives. The first one is Danny, where I met Danny in serving as a vice principal for a short term in a fourth grade English as second language classroom in a neighboring town of Fall River, Massachusetts. And then the, author, the second one is an immigrant girl. This girl is noted in 19th century social organization Minute Notes. And the author just cites her as an immigrant girl with no name. So again, Danny's story. It's interesting that out of my 24 years of education and in instructing classes, first in seventh grade, then sixth grade, and eighth grade in a middle school, then I moved up to a high school and instructed biology and chemistry, and then later started instructing at a community college, moving up to the university, teaching undergraduate level courses, then being asked to join in with master's level courses and chair a graduate level department and teach some doctoral level courses. Out of all the students I've been exposed to, I chose Danny, and I have a lot of stories about Danny. However, out of all of Danny's stories, I chose one to talk to you about today. I hope that I have a few minutes at the end of this presentation to share with you that yesterday was the first day of school in Fall River, and in the beginning, all the educators are sitting in the auditorium, and they provide snapshots of students and give a little glimpse into the lives of different students. Out of the 10,000 students in Fall River schools, I was so excited, but at the same time felt like crying because one of the students that was pictured was Danny. So it's really important to me to do justice to the story, and I hope I have the time to share with you a little glimpse of the outcome. But again, as a vice principal, I was called to the fourth grade classroom where Danny was throwing some books. Earlier that day, I was called along the hallway because his sister was crying. His sister opened up and shared with me in broken Spanish because they recently moved here from Guatemala that she was upset because someone had stolen her morning snack. It was easy as a vice principal to calm her down. I just went to the uh, cafeteria, gave her an apple, and I was rewarded with a little hug, and she went back into her classroom. 
However, going up to Danny's classroom it wasn't so easy to calm him down or to find out what his concern was. So with that, following the bullying policy, I had to provide a safe environment for the other students, and I worked to get Danny out of the classroom and bring him into the main office. According to the bullying policy, I have to then remove him from the school to make the other students feel secure for the rest of the day. So I enter into the computer system and I look up the phone number that Danny has for contact information, and there's three numbers listed. The first one is the cell phone number for mom. I try calling mom and the voicemail box message was full. The second number listed was an aunt. I called up the number and found that it wasn't an aunt, however, it was just a friend from another state. And that's where Danny and his mom and his sister had stayed for a month when they initially came into the United States. However, I learned from the aunt that her husband was on a fishing ship and returned back home after a month. And so the mom you know, or the aunt had to kick mom and Danny out of the house. And so then Danny, his mom, and his sister then reverted to another friend that lived in a housing project, and the family was on a waiting list for public housing. But in the meantime, the mom decided to stay with this other friend, and together Danny, his mom, and his sister shared one room in this apartment. However, when I called up the third number to speak to a neighbor, the neighbor shared with me that she saw Danny's mom at the bus stop that day, dropping Danny and his sister off. The neighbor told me that mom shared with her that that day she was told that they were going to be kicked out of the second apartment. Now, according to the school policy, students are assigned to a classroom based upon where they're located in the school district. So the address that was held for Danny and his sister was that of the first house. And so in order for Danny's mom to get them to school every day, she had to get up early, leave that housing project that she was now staying in with a friend in one room, walk along the waterfront in downtown Fall River, cross over the major highway that divides the two sides of the city, and then travel to the center of the city to take the assigned bus to get her children to school. The neighbor assured me that she would try to get in touch with Danny's mom. An hour had passed and the school adjustment counselor who only spoke Portuguese arrived. She was able to help me when Danny's mom called to explain that mom had to come and pick up Danny. Danny began crying and mom shared that she had no way to come take Danny out of the school. We assured her that the school would pay for a taxi to get Danny, get Danny's mom, bring her to school, and then remove Danny from school for the day. It was January and Danny's mom arrived very beautiful, young, Hispanic woman in tight, worn jeans, spring coat, short sleeve shoes, and sandals. She came in, and she looked very tired. And when we explained to her that Danny just had to leave for the day to try for a better day tomorrow, she began crying, and she felt it was her fault because she shared with the children at the bus stop that by the weekend they would be homeless. That's Danny's story. Now the second child, again, 19th century immigrant girl. She's recorded in April of 1874, arriving in Fall River, Massachusetts. In the 1870s, Fall River, Massachusetts was under a huge expansion. It was soon to be a world leader in fabric manufacturing, second to that only of Manchester, England. Between 1871 and 1872, there was an influx of 20,000 immigrants coming into Fall River, Massachusetts. The majority of them traveled into the United States from Boston, coming on the Old Colony Railroad from Boston with the plans to arrive in Fall River to then take the Providence Steamship Authority down to New York, where the majority of them planned to meet family in New York to then settle for the promise of starting it new in America. Many of them did not recognize the costs associated with the long travel. So some of them would travel from Boston, come into Fall River, and very much like this immigrant girl and her mom, would then come with loads of goods as passengers, arriving in that same waterfront that Danny would travel with his mom and sister. But they didn't have the means to move on two streets over to then take the steamship to, to their families in New York. Many of them, what they would do is then revert to say, we'll spend some time working in the mills in Fall River. 
it was recorded that the immigrant girl and her mom walked along the waterfront. And as they walked along the waterfront, they walked by two huge new mills, traveled up a hill, and by the hill was exposed to three mills on one side and one on the other side. It's recorded in history that many of these new immigrants felt suffocated and felt overwhelmed by the enormous size of the mills. The immigrant girl and her mom traveled up to the main street in Fall River, and they just walked back and forth because they had no means to continue on their travel, but they had no place to go. So again, they were homeless. So again, safety. Let's talk now about technology and technical skills. Technical skills for Danny where now in Massachusetts, a lot of the policymakers are looking to provide a huge, um, huge support for STEM education. And a lot of schools are now providing beautiful access to technology in computer labs like that of Danny's class. There's a set defined curriculum with expectations, integrated technology activities. And even there's a clear assessment in certain strategies that teachers are receiving professional development. However, you have some children like Danny who are overwhelmed by their other social circumstances or maybe the barriers of that picking up the second language where the scientific terminology or the technical skills is just not something they're interested in. The girl in the 19th century, again, was a bit more fragmented in her opportunities for education. Okay. The curriculum defined by schooling in the 1870s in Fall River, Massachusetts, like that of today in Massachusetts, was dictated like, by business owners and policy makers. The school committee members in Fall River, Massachusetts were predominantly mill owners. And they were very clear to describe that it was the purpose in education to provide a technical skill education for students so that they would have a strong future working in the mills. However, there was a big difference in the education opportunities for non-working students, where non-working students were provided with mechanical sciences, physical, and chemical strong academic background. However, if you were a child in the evening school, and they offered an alternative evening school so the children could work during the day in the mills and then perform in the evening skills afterwards, those students would just learn technical training to be able to man the instruments and not serve as innovators of the new technology. The third one, again, safety, technical skills, but then civic responsibility or citizenship. I don't have to really provide a huge difference in the social structure of Fall River, Massachusetts for both these children, because if you just take a walk through New Bedford or a walk through Fall River, you can see the visual structures of the differentiation between the socioeconomic status of these children compared to other children. If you look, many of the immigrant children coming in or the poor children like Danny still live in the existing tenement houses that were built in the 1870s. Between 1871 and 1876, over a five-year period, 12,000 individual new household units were built specifically in tenement homes to serve as the place for the workers in the mills. There was a, a note. Um, mentioning that possibly the poor health of the textile workers was due to the lack of sunlight. So what they did was they made sure that a lot of the new tenement homes were built with huge bay windows with the idea that when people were home, they'd pick up that extra sunlight during the weekends so they could work longer hours during the day. Danny and again, the immigrant girl, both of them might be living in the same tenement houses of that of the urban city. However, the mill owners or that uh, the children of more prominent in uh, the city would be living in the Victorian homes, former homes built by the mill owners or here in New Bedford of the whaling, um, whaling families. So again, if you look at the experiences of where these children just feel as home or define as home, it's pretty hard for them to work together as a team and to share common language or share common experiences or to build a community when they have such different experiences in their life. 
This is an example of if I was a classroom teacher in the 1870 and I was talking about thermodynamics and talk about convection, which was very, which was, um, very commonly um, taught during that time period because it was actually the steam engine that were used for the manufacturing. So both children, technical skill children and others, both learned about thermodynamics. The examples that were given would be very difficult because thinking about heat for one set of children who lived in one home was just a continually lit fireplace. However, the other children, in order to heat and stoke the stove, had to go down to the basement and go to the fire door and open that up because there's no lawns in the tenements. There's no place to stack wood. How is it that whether it's today or over 137 years ago, we're able to provide the appropriate experiences or the appropriate activities for children when one child wakes up in the morning and sees a weathered, tattered cabinet to store their belongings, whereas another one wakes up through the glorious panes of sunlight for the day. That's their perspective of the day, and that's their perspective of the day. How is it that we can compensate for that in a classroom? Both children regardless of the time period, have a different journey they have to go from when leaving their, their house every day. Some can travel along a dark staircase, whereas others have the thick carpeted hallways. And again, when we're talking about safety, or we're talking about feeling a sense of community, that doesn't come from the heat from a fireplace, or it doesn't come from the sunlight coming through the panes, and it doesn't come from the thick carpet. The comfort or the security comes from a feeling of respect, of feeling valued, and feeling that you can serve as a contributor, as a, a part of an active conversation, be a participant in your society. So again, all I'm suggesting is that when you read in the newspaper or you hear on the news, we have these new challenges in education. We have to deal with safety. We have to deal with technical skills. We have to talk about citizenship and getting students to feel engaged. The first question I just asked with you is, how new are they? And then maybe you can ask those people that are calling for changes or calling to share their ideas to say, how much have you looked back in history? And how much do you know of problems that we've had before or how we can solve them today? Because until we truly know the history and know the lives of these children, bullying policies, civic engagement, service learning project, changes in standards, changes in technology, Nothing's going to happen to have that sense of self-worth or positive motivation for these students to want to pay attention or feel that they're valued. I've worked very hard writing technical skills and writing curriculum frameworks. And to me, the best education I had, regardless of all the studies I read or all the books I had, was just spending my time in the life as a vice principal of an elementary school or looking back and hearing the lives of these children. Thank you.